Hello everyone. I'm here to talk to you about what a great job I have. I have uh, for the last eight years had the opportunity to work in the area of organizational culture, employee engagement, employment branding, and it has been uh, just a heck of a ride and a, and a great career. Uh, so that's what you're going to get out of my presentation today is that I have a, I have a great job. Hopefully you'll get some more today. Uh, we're going to talk about three topics. We're going to talk about employee engagement, organizational culture, and how do you drive engagement and change your culture, which can be some of the most challenging things that, uh, that we do in an organization. Uh, let's dive right in first with employee engagement. What is employee engagement? So think for a second about when you were truly engaged in something. Uh, if it wasn't on the job with your studies, if it wasn't with your studies, perhaps with a sport, perhaps with a book that you were, that you were reading. These are moments when you're focused, when you're doing what you do because you love to do it, when you're feeling fulfilled. If you can do these kinds of things on the job, you're not really working for a living, are you? And that's what we're trying to do with employee engagement. Now, I work for um, Conexa, IBM. We were acquired last year. And we have a specific definition of engagement. People know this in their heart. They know what, uh, what employee engagement is. But we have to have, if we're going to study it and measure it, we need to have some kind of index that we can measure against, right? So let's take a look at how we think about engagement. This isn't the only way to think about engagement, but it is a way of thinking about employee engagement. And we think about engagement as the extent to which employees are motivated to contribute to organizational success and they're willing to apply discretionary effort to accomplishing tasks important to the achievement of organizational goals. So there's several things going on in there. The first is this level of motivation, this focus, this sense of fulfillment that comes out of that is all very important. Uh, and then there's the discretionary effort. We used to think 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would take employee satisfaction surveys. And we came to realize after a while that employee satisfaction is not what we're after. What we're after is engagement. Satisfaction, I can be satisfied drinking a beer, playing a video game with my son on the couch, right? Satisfaction. They don't want to pay me for that though, right? They want to pay you to actually do some work and you want to do some work that's fulfilling and engaging for you. And so that's what we're trying to do. And when you have this sense, you will dive in. Discretionary effort is fun. This is something that you will do because you want to do it. You will finish your work and see that someone else needs help and you'll dive in and help them without a second thought. That's what engaged employees do. Now, how do we measure this at Conexa? We have a, an engagement index that we use. It has four different items. Satisfaction, advocacy, commitment, and pride. And let's take a look at these for a second. Uh, the first one is satisfaction, right? So that is an element that you're looking for. And what we say is, overall, I'm extremely satisfied with this company as a place to work. Now, some people would say, why would you use the word extremely? You know, that's kind of a, an extreme word to put in there. The reason we do that is, uh, statistically, we want to create variance. So we create uh, extremely so that less people are likely to answer strongly agree to that question on our five-point scale that we use. Uh, second, the advocacy item. I would gladly refer a good friend or family member to this company for employment. We want to create ambassadors. For a company. We want to create ambassadors that go out, they talk about the company, what it's like to work there, its products, its customer service level, the good things it does for its community. These are the kinds of things that we want uh, an engaged employee to be all about for us. Commitment. I rarely think about looking for a new job with another company. This is the toughest item. All right, This item is traditionally the lowest. Now it's gone up since 2008 as, the, as we've gone into the global recession. Um, but that item is beginning to swing back up as we're slowly coming out of this in the labor market these days. That is an item that if you can score 60% on that, you're doing fine. Many of the other items we see significantly higher than that across the globe. And then lastly, pride. I'm proud to work for this company. A very simple item, but it has a lot of connotation there, right? If you are overworked, underpaid, hate your boss, don't fit into your team, the culture is uncomfortable. This is not a place you're proud of. This is the place you go, you do your job, you get your paycheck, and you get the heck out the door at 5 o'clock. That's what we do when we don't have a lot of pride for our company. When we're proud of the company, it's an offshoot of the things that we do. It's an offshoot of feeling engaged, of feeling like you're a part of the company, of being truly aligned to the organization and helping that organization achieve its goals. And that's what we're trying to do with employee engagement. 
Now, we have this, this complicated model on the, on the next slide here, and it's what we call the high performance engagement model. But when you pull it apart, it's really not that complicated. We know that the architects of high performance are, are leadership. Okay? They need to set the tone, they need to communicate the future vision of the organization so that people know how they're going to be aligned. The, Interactive goals, the things that we're looking to do, of course, high engagement. We know that this will predict employee commitment. We know that it will predict discretionary effort. We have tied this numerous times to lots and lots of different financial metrics within organizations. And we've seen, um, almost without exception, it drives business results that we're seeing over on the right-hand side. Now, in the middle and the bottom, we have this high performance enablement. This is something relatively new for us, but we came to realize engagement isn't the only thing we should be measuring. Oftentimes, employees are having a very hard time, but it's really not about engagement. They don't have the tools and resources, or the company doesn't have the focus that it needs on, on helping customers, so helping you do your job, helping you serve your clients or your customers or each other. If you don't have the tools and resources that you need to do your job, don't worry about engagement. Don't worry about culture. Get them the tools and resources so they can do their job. This is what I tell my clients when I'm advising on, on these areas. If there's a couple of these items that we ask in the survey, if those items score low, those are the items you need to focus on first before you begin to think about some of the softer things like engagement and, and culture. So just having the, the engagement index isn't enough, all right? Employee engagement is an outcome. That's what we're trying to achieve. We also have to measure the things that drive the outcomes. And that's what we try and do with the rest of the survey. So the four items on the engagement index are measuring engagement. The rest of the survey are divided up into various dimensions. How we choose these dimensions is in collaboration with our clients. What's important? What are you focused on? What are some of the things that we need to uh, look at for you? And these are some of the, the drivers. We talk about drivers of, of employee engagement. These are dimensions. And within each of these dimensions, we asked several items on the survey. And again, it's a five point scale from strongly disagree up through strongly agree. And what we've done is we've pulled from our database over the course of the last, well, it's not the last four years, but from 2008 to 2012, which is a very interesting time period because that's the heart of the Great Recession that we've come out of. Um, and these are how the drivers have shifted over that period. The way we get these drivers is we run a very s simple statistical analysis. It's just a simple correlation. And we look at which items on the survey, within which dimensions on a survey, are most strongly correlated with engagement. So when the items go up, engagement goes up. When the items go down, engagement go down. Now correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, but it is an important factor for us to, to look at. Now what we've seen is that leadership future vision traditionally going all the way back to 2008 has been a very key driver of employee engagement. It is strongly correlated with employee engagement. So what we know is if leadership is wishy-washy about what they want to do with the organization and what the future vision is and what it holds for the organization, uh, the rest of the organization is wishy-washy. They don't know where they fit in. They don't know where they're headed. They don't know what's in it for them. They know they're working very, 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 very hard, but they don't know what's going to come out of that either for the organization or for themselves. This is a mistake and this is something we focus on with our clients all the time. Now, as we move through the rest of these, I want to talk about the bottom one, all right? Manager effectiveness. We have several items that we ask all the time that feed into manager effectiveness. How well you communicate, feedback, setting expectations. Uh, I personally love the item, um, is your manager a great leader? Because when people, we know from running these correlations, that when people perceive their manager as being a great leader, they're doing all of these other things. And that's kind of an outcome item in and of itself. But manager effectiveness, you'll see here, very, very low in terms of the correlation. So the old adage, people don't quit jobs, they quit managers, may not be entirely true. We know that truly engaged employees really focus on their work, they're willing to put up with a manager that's less than satisfactory for them, and they're willing to um, ride that storm out for a while. Now, not forever. This is something that people have to focus on, and, and most organizations have a pretty decent way of measuring these things. But it's, uh, it's something that they, they definitely need to look at. So when we look at measuring employee engagement, what we're looking for is doing comparisons internally and externally. 
And what we have within our World Norms database is we do every year about 13 million employee surveys every single year. And we take the last three years of those data and we analyze them by country, by every demographic you could imagine, uh, job functions, industries, regions, um, and then the race, gender, color, creed, all of the diversity demographics. And we look at this every which way in order for people to be able to understand how do they stack up? How do they stack up within their industry? How do they stack up globally? How do they stack up by job function and any other demographic cut that you might be able to, to look at? So people understand how are we doing? And then internally, we'd like to give people an internal benchmark. Your top 10%. These are your most engaged people. If you want to be like them, these are some of the things that you need to focus on and this is the score you need to be looking at. All right, let's take a pause now for some discussion. All right, now let's move into organizational culture. What we're going to talk about in this section is what is culture? Why is it important? How do you find out? Uh, what your organizational culture is. Um, now, I want to be real clear right up front. We at Connects IBM have a way of thinking about organizational culture that's not the only way. We have a definition of organizational culture. It's not the only definition. What I want to emphasize right up front is organizational culture is difficult to put to pin down. It's very, it's a, it's like mercury, right? It's all over the place. And if you try and you know grab onto it solidly you'll find that it's gone it's gone all over the place the problems have been traditionally as people have thought about culture and they try and think of culture as a thing and they realize they don't really know what that thing is so we're going to move through this and, and perhaps give you a way of kind of getting your head around this notion of organizational culture first of all we want to start with the end in mind why do you look at culture what are some of the outcomes well when i talk to my clients what i'm looking for for them is to understand where are their interests. Is it external messaging? Is it recruiting people who are really understanding what the culture is, fitting in, they're gonna stick around for a while, they're gonna perform well, they're gonna be highly engaged. Uh, the next is internal communications, retention, keeping people who are gonna stick around. We wanna make sure that the people who currently work for the organization are as aligned with the employee value proposition or with the employment brand of an organization as the candidates that you're bringing in the door. Uh, when I work with, with my teams, and, and I run the, the research side of the business, but there's a whole creative side that does career sites and recruitment advertising and copywriting and all sorts of this creative work. Well, my job is as the eye roll minimizer. You know, we've all seen these kinds of things where a company will put out some messaging, uh, you know, all right, suddenly, we're innovative. Uh, we have great integrity here. You know, these, these meaningless buzzwords that get thrown out and are held up as the standard and this is what we are and the organization just says, oh, come on. You know, what, what does that really mean? You know, we're, we're innovate. Well, where's the innovation around here? And that's some of the things that happens if you can't really explain authentically who you are and what your culture is without resorting to these big blanket terms. And that's what we try and do with some of the internal communications. We want to, especially now as the economy begins to turn the corner, re-recruit your existing employees. We want to re-recruit these people who have been working very hard for a very long time. Now we'll remember in 2008, 2009, companies were laying off people constantly. Um, and what was happening is the people they were laying off were the average performers, the low performers. The people who stayed, you're most talented. What does that mean now in 2014? It means your most talented people are your most tired people. And further, they haven't gotten many raises. You know, hopefully, they've got some kudos, some recognition, maybe some development opportunities, but they're tired. And frankly, they're going to be looking around. And they're going to be looking around at other organizations. They think the grass is greener. They're going to be leaving. We need to remind those people of why they fell in love with this company in the first place. And we need to let them know what the future vision is. And we need to let them know there's relief on the way. This is what's in it for you. And if we're able to do that, perhaps we can get these people to realize, oh, okay, it was worth it. Everything's gonna be all right. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. And then lastly, there's culture strategy. Culture strategy is internally trying to fix a culture that's dysfunctional or preserve a culture or drive engagement within a culture or make a culture more functional. It might be fun, but it's not functional. 
Uh, these are some of the things that we work with with our clients as well. So we may come in, do a leadership intervention almost, and, and help them. And we're going to talk about that in the last section today. How do we change a culture as we move forward? Next, we want to talk a little bit about the ROI of this kind of work, uh, the return on investment. Why would you want to to do this? How, this is the soft, squishy stuff, and sometimes it's very hard to go to a CFO of a company and say, "Hey." You know, let's spend a whole bunch of money on studying a culture without being able to show any kind of return on those dollars. Well, fortunately, there's been some work in this area, and the very best study that's been done in this area is a little dated. It's 1992. It was done by Cotter and Heskett, but I think it's still highly relevant today, and on smaller scales, it's been replicated over time. What Cotter and Heskett did is they took over 200 different companies, and they studied these companies, and they grouped them into two groups. One group that did something, anything, to actively manage their corporate cultures. And another group that did absolutely nothing. They just let it organically run its course. And then they compared the business performance over a time period of these two groups of companies. So as we look at the, at the slide here, we see the companies that did something to actively manage their corporate culture had a 682% increase in revenue versus 166% over the same time period for those that did nothing. Net income, 757% versus 1%, and stock price, 901% return versus 74% for those that did nothing. Now, those are striking numbers, and I don't want to tell you that working on your culture is the only way to achieve those numbers, but I will tell you it's a mindset. It's a tool belt. It's one of the things that you focus on. You focus on the people. You focus on engagement. You focus on the people you're bringing in the door, keeping them happy, keeping them rewarded, keeping them engaged. And these are the things that good companies pay attention to and monitor and nurture in order to achieve the kind of success that we're seeing here. Now, let's talk about culture. There are a lot of definitions out there. Very simple definitions. It's the way we get things done around here. Very complicated definitions that take up paragraphs that are out there. I could quote some of these to you just to make myself look smart, but that's not what we're here for. What we do in the business world is rather than agonize over what culture is, we put that aside for a second and we say, how can we apply this knowledge? How can we make this workable? What are the levers we can find in all of these definitions that we can pull in order to leverage that in an employment brand, drive it in engagement through internal communications, or maybe even change a culture overall? So this is what we did. We divided up culture really into three parts. The rational facts, the emotional truths, and the personality. And at the heart of that is the employee value proposition. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So first, the rational facts. This is the easy stuff. Look at the career site. Read an annual report. Look at onboarding or recruitment materials. Look at survey data. This all tells us the basic facts about what it's like to work for an organization. Then we get into the hard stuff, the emotional truths. This is the unspoken code of an organization. This is the organizational subconscious. These are the things that people are just barely aware of and can't quite articulate that we pull out by talking to them. We do focus groups, we do interviews with senior leaders of an organization, and they tell us things that we never could have discovered in a survey because we wouldn't have even known what we didn't know in order to ask it on the survey. Let me give you an example. I was uh, working with a huge retailing organization uh, across North America and, uh, and Canada. And it's not Cabela's, by the way, because I'm going to show you some Cabela's work later on. Uh, but it's a, it's a large organization. And I was at their corporate headquarters, and I had asked to speak to some relatively new hires that had been identified as high potentials. And we were sitting around, and what I saw was this, this uh, young man, kind of engaged in the, in the conversation, very interested in what we were talking about, and suddenly he just kind of dives in. And he says, you know, every night from 5.30 to 7 o'clock, I sit at my computer and play solitaire and surf the internet. And my jaw fell open, and I looked around the table, and really nobody else's jaw fell open. And I said, why do you do that? And he said, well, I wait for my boss to leave. When he leaves, I leave. And I, so I said to the group, is this some kind of unspoken code here? And they said, no. One of them was an assistant buyer, and she said, I was explicitly told when I was hired, I need to be in the door before my buyer and out the door after my buyer. They were told. And this surprised me, because the measure of productivity shouldn't be how long your butt is in the seat. There are other measures of productivity, right? And that's what we're looking at, at trying to figure out. So I talked to the CEO the very next day, and I told him the story. I didn't identify the person, but I told him the story. And he said, that's ridiculous. We need to find a way to work smarter, not harder here. That's a problem. 
And then I talked to the COO, and the chief operating officer told me, you know, I've always figured if we can get them to 60 hours, then we'll worry about making them productive. That's a mindset that shows a culture that is um, out of touch with itself. Leadership doesn't understand what's going on with the employees. The employees don't really know, understand what's going on with each other. Um, people hiding coats in the bathroom because their kid has a soccer game or a play and they don't want to grab their coat and walk out the door at 4 o'clock because people will look at them bad. Even if they have permission from their boss, they don't want that kind of attention. So they hide their coat in the bathroom, they grab it and they walk out the door. All right? This is a little bit of a dysfunctional sick culture, right? It's not about being productive, it's about putting on a show for people and you're not going to get good work done that way. Now let's look at the last category. The last category is the personality. Um, just like a person, we have basic facts about ourselves. How old are you? Where did you go to school? Are you married? Do you have kids? Then there's the emotional truths. What are your personal idiosyncrasies? Are you a procrastinator? Are you a perfectionist? All right, what are some of the weird things that you've got going on in you? We all have them. But we all have a personality too. And so does an organization. I, I believe an organization has a feel, has a charm, has a charisma. Just like people, there's some people that you're extremely attracted to instantly, and other people where the very same things that attracted the first person put other people off completely. Same thing works with an organization. My wife works in one company, very formal, very process driven. She fits in great there. I started out working at a very entrepreneurial organization, very nimble, freewheeling. I fit in great there. We're going to see how well I fit in at, at, uh, at IBM, but I think everything's going to be okay. What we do for the personality is we've got this survey instrument. I'm going to show you that next. Uh, that we use. Again, it's not the only survey instrument to get quantitative data to, to validate some of these things, but it's the one we use. Now, at the heart of that, let's talk a little bit about the employee value proposition. Uh, when you're working with culture, you want to be able to leverage that culture in a way that brings people in the door that are going to fit into that culture, and the employee value proposition helps you do that. The employee value proposition is the get versus the give. We all have a certain amount of um, energy and, and expertise that we put into a job kind of sweat equity, right? And then we get out of that job, things like pay and benefits and, and these things, but there's something more. Pay and benefits never equal the amount of effort and, and caring and passion that we have to put in, right? The EVP is why I stay even though I'm overworked and underpaid. We're balancing the scales. There are other things. The people I work with, the people I work for, the customers I serve, the clients I work with, the larger community of uh, people who work in OD or IO psychology uh, who work where we can share this kind of knowledge that we're sharing today. Uh, these are the things that really help me keep interested in my job and balance out that employee value proposition for me. So what we try and do for organizations is to capture all of these things, the rational facts, the emotional truths, the personality, so that it's an authentic way of expressing who you are that will attract the right people and hopefully stop the wrong people from even wanting to walk in the door. I'm going to show you some examples of those here in a bit. All right, our next section is to talk about driving change. After all, isn't that really what we're looking at? Transformation. How can we make the companies, the organizations, the teams that we work with better, more productive, happier, more engaged? Get people who feel good about coming to work and who feel fulfilled about the work that they're doing and the people they're doing it with. Let's start by talking about driving employee engagement. We talked about how important that is. We do a survey, we get the results, we give reports. All the managers in an organization who have more than five people that respond in order to keep it anonymous, they get a report. What they do with that report is crucial. If you do a survey of your employees and you do nothing with that data, you will lower engagement. It, you will be far worse than having never done the survey in the first place. And we know that over and over and over and over again. We put in place, when we do a survey more than two years for any organization, what we call the behavior change index. And these are a couple of questions that ask, do you think anything's gonna be done with this? Was anything done with last year's information? Have you seen any change? Very simple items. And if they answer no, we look at their engagement score. If they answer yes, and they agree that lots has been done, and people reacted, and they used this data, and they considered it important, then their engagement was higher. Now, we know that people get bitter and unhappy when they give feedback and it's ignored, and that's what this is. This is feedback. Now, the feedback has to be two ways. And so when a leader 
gets, and I like, I like leaders rather better than managers, by the way, but when a leader or a manager gets their report, what do they do with that report? And that's the crucial point. That's the touch point between the teams, the individual employees, and the organization. And they need to take that data, look it over, figure out what's their level of engagement, how are they compared internally, externally, and then what are the drivers. And we will give them those correlations so they know which dimensions are driving engagement on their team as well as the organization overall. And then they pick one or two things that they want to work on. But they don't pick these by themselves. They need to have a meeting, a feedback meeting. Bring the entire team in. Talk about these things. Uh, give them their impression of the data. And then most importantly, begin to elicit some feedback. Okay? Surveys of any sort don't give you all the answers in the data. Some of the most valuable lessons that we can get from surveys are not the answers we get, but the questions that are elicited, the questions that you have in your hand in order to have conversations with your team that you would have never thought of having before. You know, how often do you sit down with your team and really talk about what recognition means, uh, really talk about the notion of diversity and inclusion, uh, really talk about the future vision of the organization as it's filtered all the way down through little old you and your little team. All right? Those conversations might not be happening through the year, but when you look at these data, it allows you to frame up that conversation in a way that's meaningful for people. That's what has to happen at these feedback meetings that we're talking about here. Lastly, there needs to be an action plan. An action plan um, that focuses on engagement, focuses on one or two of these drivers. You don't want to overdo it. And these are things, not just the weak points. You don't just circle your low scores on these things, but also areas that are strengths. Because these are the things that you can really leverage in an organization. If you know they're going to work for engagement, these are the things you need to focus on. And then lastly, follow through throughout the year. Remind people of why you're doing what you're doing. When people seem to be down, or when people are skeptical or cynical, or they don't want to participate, um, bring them in and ask them to participate. And say, if you think this is silly, I want you to come back next week with three ideas for some non-silly ways to drive engagement in this organization. And that's the kind of thing that will bring people in and make them feel like they're a part of the process. So that's what we do that rounds out this, the whole survey process. It's not a matter of gathering data. Ah, oh, there, they're happy, they gave their feedback. You have to use that feedback into eliciting conversations throughout the entire year. Engagement is not an event, it's a journey. And it's something that you need to keep constantly focused on. Now let's talk about culture. So there are a lot of very complicated change management models out there, and I encourage you to explore them, use them if you like them. Uh, again, for me, simple is better. And when I looked at these models, and when I look back on my experiences in researching culture and seeing some of the things that have really had an impact in organizations, I boil them down into four simple steps. And if you do these four things, and you do them well, and you never stop doing them, I'm convinced that you can change a culture. The first thing you want to do is communicate the vision. So you understand where you're at because you've done the cultural assessment. And then you communicate, all right, this is where we're at, but this is where we need to be. This is our vision for the future. And generally speaking, this needs to come from leadership. You don't have the marketing department brainstorm over something that sounds great. It has to be something that is meaningful to the business and perhaps even meaningful to you as a leader of an organization. You communicate this out. This is where we need to go. But you can't stop there. Step two is model new behaviors. And this is important. The leaders have to participate in this of the organization. They need to model these new behaviors. The behaviors I'm talking about clearly support the vision that you've just communicated. And these behaviors really need to set the precedent for one simple idea. And this is the idea I try and get across with my clients more than any other idea. And that is, you need to have a very clear understanding of what great looks like here. And if you understand what great looks like here, and you can put that on a wall, and people can look at that, and they can point to that, and they can say, oh, that's what great looks like here. I can do that. And then they go on their way, and they see the leaders modeling these behaviors, and they emulate those leaders, and everything you know, works well. But there's other people who will look at that, and they'll say, oh, I can't do that. And that's OK. They can find other opportunities in a place that's more comfortable for them. Um, that's what we're trying to do. And when we see these behaviors then being emulated throughout the organization, we support that with step three, reward and recognize. We want to create recognition programs that are framed up by the culture work that we do and that lend themselves nicely toward the vision of what you're trying to accomplish. So they're authentic as well as aspirational. And then lastly, this one gets ignored sometimes. 
tell the success stories, okay? Once you know what great looks like here, continually reinforce that through stories. There's an OD model called appreciative inquiry. This is something that you might want to research as a model for change. And appreciative inquiry is all about people sitting down and talking. But they talk in a positive way and they share stories and experiences. Sometimes they're free flowing. Other times they can be framed discussions. When we work with our clients, we often will take elements of the employee value proposition that we developed based on the research and we get them to talk about examples. For instance, you know, tell me a story about when we work smarter and not harder. Right? We ignore the times, you know, that the story I told about the guy in the focus group, we ignore that. We talk about all the positive things. And we know from research that if people are telling stories that are positive and supportive of a vision, pretty soon the culture follows along. People want to aspire to these great things. And they will do that if they have a clear vision in their head as to what that looks like and how they can support it. And that's what we're trying to do with these stories. Now again, this is not an event, okay? This is a journey. And even more than employee engagement, this is a long journey. I don't even go back and remeasure for a minimum of three years and only then if there's been some kind of major change, either externally or internally in the organization. It takes a long time to do this. Now, there are parts of the culture you want to constantly be monitoring through engagement surveys or other avenues, but overall the culture takes a long time to change these cultures. It's evolution, not revolution in, in culture change, generally speaking. Now, the last thing I want to point out in this change model is um, in step two, model new behaviors. These new behaviors don't necessarily all have to come from existing employees. Sometimes, we can hire change agents. We can begin to hire people that fit the new model of the culture that we're looking at. But I want to give a big word of caution on this. If you bring in change agents into an organization and you don't support them, inevitably they will either leave or conform. And you will not get the change that you're looking for. And the type of support that these folks need is almost always a prominent leader in the organization supporting them openly. So that when the line of people come, and there will be a line saying, I don't like the way the new guy's doing this, the leader says, that's why I hired him. You need to do it the way the new guy's doing it. And if they don't do that, you're not going to get the kind of change that you want. Again, it's leadership supporting these things. It's very important. The next slide is a little bit of a summary of all of the work that we do and how it fits into an organization. Uh, it all starts with the research. You need to understand at a foundation, where are you now? What's your level of engagement? What is your culture? Authentically, here's who you are. Now, who do you want to be? Uh, you need to sit down with the leaders and really explain, all right, this is where you are, and this is how I see it impacting your, your performance as an organization or as a team. And help these, these leaders understand, all right, these are the steps I need to take to move forward. And that's what happens in step two. We, we distill, we define the culture and the, and the EVP, and we help then leverage this information in step three where we're talking about the meaningful expression of the culture. What are the things that we can do with this information? Uh, there is a lot on the, the external side, the recruitment side or the employment branding side, recruitment ads, uh, career sites. Uh, we talk about a fit quiz there. That's uh, in informational, entertaining uh, quiz that lives on a career site where people can go through that and find out whether they'd be a good fit for an organization. Employee referral programs. Um, sourcing plans, all of these things can come out of this from a candidate attraction standpoint. Internally, to retain your talent that you have now, uh, a solid rollout of the employee value proposition, letting people know. Again, you don't want to study your culture and then not tell people who participated what you found. All right? So it's important to roll out. This is what we found. This is the result of what we have. This is where we are. And more importantly, this is where we want to be. Sometimes where we want to be might be preserving where we're at now. I've worked with plenty of clients that way. Culture training, uh, recruiters, hiring managers, even team leads need this kind of training. Onboarding, very important. Uh, recognition programs, story gathering, that's that appreciative inquiry process. We do that with many clients of ours and we find it to be very effective in not only getting awareness of the work that we've done in the new EVP and why it's valuable, but also getting those stories going, you know, lubricating change in the organization. And then lastly, culture strategy. The information that we have informs the engagement survey process in a great way. It helps the engagement survey team understand some of the very specific areas they need to be measuring and paying attention to. For instance, that one retailer needs to be focused on working smarter, not harder, and add some items into the survey to see how they're doing on that. 
Um, other areas that you would focus on would be uh, particular types of recognition that's happening. Uh, for instance, at, at uh, Conexa for a long, long time, we recognized um, in the heroic way the firefighters. And for us, it was always the people who rushed in to save the day. And so oftentimes we would have project managers who stayed up till two in the morning to fix this error on a huge survey going out to 120,000 employees the next day. And they would come in, everybody would applaud, hooray, hooray, hooray. You know what? They were the one who made the error in the first place. But we forget about that, and they're the heroes. So instead, we put in place a recognition program called the Everyday Heroes. And so we began to measure, how are we doing on that? Are we being proactive? Are we rewarding the people who do a good job every single day, as opposed to the people who just put out fires and just react? Uh, lastly, we can do organizational development interventions. Uh, you can see why mergers and acquisitions would be a big deal. Um, they say, their studies have said, there's about 40% of mergers and acquisitions fail because of poor culture fit. These people can't work together. And knowing that very early in the process and knowing how to bridge those gaps can go a long way towards saving some of these mergers and acquisitions and really making it a better place to work. Because after all, that's what we're trying to do is create a better place to work. And when we create a better place to work, a better culture and highly engaged employees, people feeling fulfilled, we all become better employees. We become better citizens. We become better husbands, better dads, better moms, right? And that's what we're trying to do. And so I encourage everybody here and everybody watching this, uh, this video to do that. Find a way to transform the team you're working on, the organization you're working with, and even your own family, your own life. These are things that you can bring to bear um, in all of your life. Transform your culture, transform your brand, and uh, enjoy your life. Thank you.